Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13, as our series, Dear Church, continues with the sixth letter written by Christ to churches in a region that we now know today as Turkey. And these seven churches, John would have penned this letter under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And then this letter would have been carried by a messenger from the island of Patmos, which was out there in the sea between what is Greece and Turkey. And it would have arrived and it would have been carried on a circuit. You remember circuit riding preachers? No, you're not old enough to remember circuit riding preachers. I'm not either. But they existed at one time where they would go around to different churches and preach on horseback. Well, I don't know if it was horseback or chariot or just walking. But these, this letter would have been carried and probably copied by hand. Uh, for those particular churches and and this gentleman would have made the route through these seven churches to deliver them the whole of the book of Revelation and within that whole something specific for each of those seven churches and today we read about the church at Philadelphia Revelation chapter 3 verse 7 if you're physically able I'd invite you to stand as we read the Word of God. This is indeed the Word of the Lord. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven, and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, this is your word given to a church in the midst of a difficult time and a difficult place. Father, we need to hear such a word today. We need to be encouraged, we need to be assured, and we need to be challenged. So, Father, I pray you will do for us what you did for them. Grant us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say, and may we be repentant and obedient to it. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. In our series and on this journey today, we arrive in Philadelphia, not PA, but the ancient Philadelphia, originally a city of commerce sitting on a main trade route to the east, and a city of agriculture where volcanic ash made the earth rich for agriculture. This city, like the city of Sardis we talked about last week, was damaged in an earthquake in 17 AD. In fact, Sardis and 10 other cities were involved in that earthquake. And like Sardis, this city was rebuilt by Tiberius Caesar and because he rebuilt the city they honored him with a monument there and and Caesar worship became a part of their pagan culture so they worshiped the Caesar there we also know that there was a sizable Jewish community there a sizable enough community for a synagogue and we also know that these particular Jews were not friendly to the gospel, and they were not friendly to the church of the gospel. And so it was not exactly a Christian culture, was it? 
The church was surrounded by temptations and always faced some degree of threat from both the Romans and the Jews. At best, it would have been an uncomfortable place for a Christian to live, and at worst, it was a dangerous place to be a member of a gospel church. And yet this church, we find in this text, was keeping the word of Christ. It's an amazing, wonderful thing. And in this letter, Jesus writes to them to do three things that we're going to note in the sermon this morning. First of all, Jesus encourages his church, and he encourages his church, first of all, by who he is in verse 7, by who he is. And there Jesus says, I am the Holy One. And, and that, that phrase, we could spend an hour just unpacking that phrase, but just to strip it down and, and just give it to you straight, this means he was God. He was God. He further says, I am the true one. That means he is the genuine one. He is the real one. He is the genuine, true, real God. As opposed to the pagan gods of the culture in Philadelphia, he says, I am God, and I am the true, the real God. And he says, I have the key of David. I am the Messiah who has come in the line of David. I am the king. I am the sovereign king who holds the master key. And as the sovereign king who holds the master key, if I open a door, that door is going to stay open. And if I shut and lock a door, that door is going to stay shut and locked. I am the sovereign God who is the real God, who is the king and sovereign of the entire universe. Church, listen to me, that's your Jesus. Child of God, that's your Jesus. Whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, this is your Jesus. So why would his church not be about him? Why would your life not be lived for him? Why would you think your life could end well without him? Since this is who he is. But secondly, he encourages his church by what he had done. He tells them, I have opened a door before you that no one, that not anyone is going to be able to shut. And what door is that? That door is the door into his kingdom. It is the gospel door. And by the gospel, those in this church, these believers had entered through that door and entered into his kingdom and were now a part of his church. And through their gospel witness through their preaching the gospel, teaching the gospel, and sharing the gospel, and living the gospel, others in their community were entering through and into the kingdom of God, this in spite of the pagan culture and the religious opposition that they were facing. I want you to listen to me. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ does not need a friendly government nor a calm religious climate to pursue and fulfill God's gospel purpose through them. The church just needs Jesus. Amen. When he opens the door of his kingdom for the gospel, no government and no religious opposition will shut it. I am grateful and appreciative for the freedom of religion and speech afforded to me in this country, and I speak in this country for it. But hear me, the protection of the state is not necessary for the furtherance of the gospel. The power of Jesus is. I think sometimes we think that for the gospel to succeed in any other place on the planet, that we must export our form of government, our form of culture, our form of religious protections for it to succeed there. And if change does not occur politically or militarily in some places, the gospel will never thrive there. Well, I have a question. Why? Do they have to keep imprisoning churches in China? And why do they have to keep killing believers 
in North Korea. And these things are ongoing. Here's the answer. Because government cannot shut the door when Jesus opens it. In communist China and in North Korea, people keep getting saved. People keep meeting in churches. They keep getting arrested for it. They keep being imprisoned for it. And they keep dying for it because the government cannot shut the kingdom door that Christ has opened there. When God opens a door, it stays open. And this should be encouraging to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he encourages them by what he knew. In general, he says, I know your works. I know everything that's going on there. And he does. He knows everything. And, and that's either a comforting thought or that's a frightening thought. I mean, you're either thankful, yes, he's paying attention, he's involved in my life, he knows what's going on, or you are scared by that statement, by what he knows, because you know that you're going to have to answer to him. For the Philadelphia church, it was the first. It was comforting. Specifically, he knew that they had little power. They were outnumbered, they were outsized, they were outfunded by the culture and by religious opposition, but they had the door opener. He knew they had kept his word. They had remained obedient to his teachings in spite of all that was wrong around them, and there was plenty. They kept sharing the gospel. They kept living the gospel. They kept loving people. They kept responding kindly to those who would treat them with evil. And as a result, God worked through them. They kept seeing people saved. They kept baptizing people. They kept teaching those people to know and, and to obey all the teachings of Jesus Christ. Listen, again, obedience to the Great Commission is not contingent upon a favorable religious and cultural climate. And he knew they had not denied his name. They resisted temptation and they endured adversity for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ, that others might know him, that others might believe in him, that others might treasure him, that others might glory in him who had delivered them from sin, who had delivered them from the wrath of God, who had delivered them into this wondrous, glorious knowledge of who Jesus is. And these same truths encourage the Lord's churches all around the world today even in places where persecution is not just imminent, but present. Secondly, Jesus assures his church, listen, faithfulness to the open door does not exclude suffering, does it? The believers in Philadelphia have been lied to and lied about, we find in this text, by religious folk, by Jews who were Jews genetically but not spiritually. They were born into the earthly family of Abraham, but they had not been born again into the family of God. And while some of their brothers and sisters had received Jesus as the Messiah and trusted Him, these Jews had not. Often they're called Judaizers. They base their righteousness on keeping their interpretation of Moses' law instead of righteousness based on Jesus' fulfillment of Moses' law. And they openly opposed Jesus. They were opponents of Christ, of his apostles, and of his churches. Jesus refers to them as the synagogue of Satan. And that name Satan, just literally translated, means adversary. They were identified with the adversary who stood against Christ, his gospel, his churches. And, and I have to imagine that facing such opposition, particularly on a regular basis, might tempt at least some in the church to wonder if it was worth it. And Jesus here assures that it is, and he does it in two ways. First of all, he would make those who would oppose them come and bow before their, before their feet and know that he loved his church. Now, one of two things I think was going to happen. One, 
through their gospel witness, through how kindly they responded to the persecution, how they prayed for those who hated them, for how they did kindness toward those who would spitefully use them, through that gospel witness, God would draw some to himself through that open door. And they'd be believers and show up where? Right there at that church with them. And they would know the love of God upon his church. But for those who would harden their hearts, those who would stiffen their necks, those who would reject that gospel call, they will know on that day when every knee will bow and every tongue will be forced to confess that Jesus is indeed Lord, the Lord's church, his believers will be held up as trophies of his grace and his love and glory will be lavished upon them and all those through the ages who have hated them, who have despised them, persecuted them, imprisoned them and killed them will be made to know that Jesus is king and that Jesus indeed loves his church. Second, Jesus promises them that he will keep them out of a trial that is to come upon the earth and here is the whole inhabited earth. And, 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 and there are scholars who disagree upon exactly the timing of this. Some say it was something that would happen to them within their lifetime. Others say that this is pointing toward the end time. And, and, and frankly, it's, it's difficult from this text to discern which. And I don't even know that that's the point for us out of this text. I think the point for us out of this text is what Peter says in 2 Peter 2, 9, when he says this, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the righteous under punishment until the day of judgment. What he's assuring his church is, I have you. You don't have to fear anything that's getting ready to happen Amen. on this planet. I have you. As we sing, I will hold you fast. Listen, if you are his, Jesus will hold you fast. And the day is coming when he will vindicate you. He will bring you through it all, and He will take you home. And the whole world, every person who's ever lived on this planet, will know that you are beloved of Jesus. Listen to me, child of God. As I have told you many times, the worst thing that could ever happen to you never will. You will never taste the wrath of God. But you will know His glory and His love for eternity. And then Jesus challenges his church. He challenges them with the hope of his coming. I am coming soon. Or it could be rendered, I am coming quickly. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. The promise of Jesus' return is repeated, of course, throughout the New Testament. And it's no different here in the book of Revelation. He's coming in the clouds and every eye will see him in 1-7. He will come like a thief in the night in 16-15. He is coming soon and here in 3-11 and then also in 22-12 and 20. He is coming and that is the hope of the church. And the hope of his coming is a challenge to us to hold fast until he comes. In fact, holding fast here is the only command that appears in this text. The only command that Jesus has for this church is the command to hold fast, to keep holding fast, to keep depending on Jesus, to keep obeying Jesus, to keep being faithful to Jesus, to keep trusting Jesus, to keep enduring patiently for Jesus. Don't give in to temptation. Don't give in to adversity. Jesus says, don't let anyone take your crown. The crown is a reward. It's a reward, a reward of faithfulness. And it could be a reference to a crown that might be set up on the head of a prince, or it could be a reference to the crown, the, the wreath that would be placed upon the head of victors in, in the Greek games who would run and perform the athletic feat and the winners, those who made it through to the end, those who made it would be given that crown, that wreath up on their head similar to a medal hung around a neck today. But it's a crown that could be taken away, a reward that could be taken away. See, here's the deal, ladies and gentlemen. Just because you have been faithful to Christ in the past does not mean you will be faithful to Him in the future. Just because you endured yesterday does not mean that you will endure today or tomorrow. Listen, we get tired, don't we? And we get tired of 
you know, tired of problems and pain, tired of struggles and sorrows, tired of duties and demands. I wonder this morning, I'm speaking to someone who's tuning in right now and, and, and you're thinking, I'm tired. What, 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 what's, what's wearing you down? What's wearying you? In the weariness, we're tempted, aren't we? To just let go, to give up, to give in. And we rationalize in that. We rationalize, well, I deserve it. It's my turn. No one will know. It's just one time. I need a break. No one's ever had it like me, and surely Jesus will understand. But Jesus is coming. And you're going to meet him. And you're going to look in the eyes of the one who wore a crown, a crown of thorns, on your behalf. And he's going to take you home to be with him forever. I really don't think that here this promise is intended to frighten them, but to encourage them. I'm coming. Don't, don't give in. Don't give up. Don't, don't quit now. Don't doubt me. You be faithful. You, you hold fast. I, I am coming, and, and I'm going to take care of everything. I, I'm going to vindicate you. I'm going to reward you. I'm going to take you home. So, so you keep holding fast to what you have in me because I'm holding fast to you. He challenges them to keep holding fast because, well speaking to you because of your destiny. I don't know about you, but, but I increasingly feel like I don't belong here. This world is not my home. I'm just a... I'm just a what? Okay. All the young folk are looking around like, now what in the world are they quoting? Really cool song, Google it. And it's often an uneasy feeling, isn't it? Especially with all the weariness. But as Jesus closes this letter, he, he challenges them to stay faithful because of their destiny. In 1 John 5, 4 and 5, we learn something. What we learn is this. We learn, John writes there, that the way to overcome the world and the one who overcomes the world and the word therefore overcome, if you go read it, is the word Nike. The same word here for conquering, Nike. Okay? So the one who overcomes the world, the one who conquers the world, the one who Nikes the world, okay, is the one who believes in Jesus Christ. The one believing in Jesus Christ will overcome the world. We're told in 1 John 4, 4 and 5. And here John, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, talks to us about the one who overcomes the world, the one who conquers the world, the one who Nikes the world. And here's what Jesus said, I'm going to do for you who trust me, who believe me. He said, I'm going to make you a pillar in the temple of God. Now, a pillar, not, not what you lay your head down on at night, not a pillar, but a pillar. A pillar is, is, is something that is put there to stay, right? Put there to stay. It's a fixture in a temple or in any kind of a building. A pillar is put there to stay. Listen, child of God, because of Jesus, you will be forever in the presence of God. Listen to Revelation chapter 21, verse 3 and 4. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Now, that's just a startling statement. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things 
have passed away. Jesus says, I'll make you a pillar in the temple of God and, and I will write the name of God and the name of His holy city, the new Jerusalem, upon you. You will be at forever in the presence of God. You'll be ever identified with God and you will have eternal access into His holy city where He is. You will never be told you can't come in here. <laughs> Last few months, I've seen these things about how even heaven has walls. And that's really a reference to the new Jerusalem. And indeed, it has walls and it has gates. But you know what Revelation 21, 25 says? It says those gates will not be shut by day. And you say, well, what about by night? It says there will be no night. <laughs> so you know what that means? Heaven, the new Jerusalem, it's always open. Amen. Always open. It's better than 7-Eleven. It's always open. Child of God, you will never be told you can't come here today. Forever in the presence of God. And Jesus said, I will write my new name upon you. We don't know exactly what that new name is. It's not been revealed yet. But here's what we do know. That Jesus has been given a name above every other name. It is a glorious name. And here's the promise of Jesus. Child of God, you who believe in me, I'm going to bring you home. And when I do, I'm going to lavish my glory upon you. My name is going to be placed upon you. And this world may have mistreated you. They may have persecuted you. They may have despised you. And they may have hated you. But listen to me, church. Jesus is saying, you're mine. And one day, you're going to be with me. And my glory is going to clothe you. My name will be upon you. I, I'm getting old, and as I was thinking about this week, I thought about B.J. Thomas. Anybody remember B.J. Thomas? Can I get a witness? Again, young folk, Google him. <laughs> thought about that song where he said, I'm headed home. I'm going home where I belong church we're headed home we're going home where we finally and forever belong he who has an ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches so I've got one last question where's your home wherever that currently is it's temporary I think most people know that my wife are renters right now. We keep looking. We spent yesterday afternoon talking about that a whole lot. And went again through everything available around here. And I got to thinking about that. And you, you know, today, if, if, if you own a house, or maybe you and the bank own a house, or maybe even if you have owned it outright, you say, that's my house. In the end, we're all renters. You're going to be evicted. Death will see to that. Or Jesus will show up. But either way, the place you call home now is temporary. Revelation ends with two eternal destinies, two eternal homes. One is the lake of fire in Revelation 20, 11 through 15, and the other is the new heaven and the new earth in Revelation chapter 21. And Jesus has opened the door to the new heaven and the new earth. Not only has he opened the door, but according to John 10 and 7 through 9, he is the door himself. He is the door of the sheep, and if anyone enters by him, he will be what? Saved. How did Jesus open that door? He went to the cross and there he died for your sins. He took the wrath of God in your place so that you would never have to know God's wrath in the lake of fire. And through his death and through his resurrection, 
He opened the way of life. He opened the door. And you enter that door by faith. You trust him. You believe what he said. You believe what he did. You accept what he has provided for you by faith. It's how you walk through the door. It's how you walk through the door into an eternal home with a new heaven, a new earth, a new city, his name written upon you. Will you trust Christ? Will you believe him today? Will you be saved? With our heads bowed, I'm going to pray for us. And then after I pray, we're going to, to continue singing. And if God is speaking to your heart, there will be pastors here at the front. Be happy to visit with you. Maybe you want to talk to someone about Christ, about salvation. Maybe you've been saved. And you say, I, I want, to, um, want to be baptized. I, I want the whole world to know that I'm a follower of Christ. You can come and talk. Maybe you want to join this church. You can come and visit with a pastor about that and how we do that. The altar is always open for prayer. But right now, right where you sit, if Christ is calling you, the door is open before you, Christ is calling you to himself, step through. You don't have to take a preacher by the hand. You don't have to walk an aisle but you have to call upon the name of Jesus, confessing that he is Lord, believing in your heart that he is raised from the dead. You call upon him. Do that right now, right now, wherever you are in this room, listening by radio, watching by television or internet, right now, wherever you are, walk through the door, trust him, believe him, receive what he has done for you right now. church be encouraged to share the gospel this week Father we come Father we would ask that right now in this moment that your spirit would be at work in our hearts and lives Father this church and other churches today need to be encouraged Father we get discourse of what we see happening in the world around us we need encouragement we need to be reminded that the power is in Christ and his gospel, not in us, not in what's around us, not even in our freedoms, but the powers in Christ who opens the door. So, Father, we're asking that you would open the door today, right here, in this moment, in this place. And we pray, Father, for our persecuted brothers and sisters of Christ in faraway places who are standing strong. And the door is open and people keep getting saved. It's an amazing thing when we think about it. And we pray for them today. God be with them. May they know the encouragement of this letter to Philadelphia, even where they are, even as they gather in homes and secret places. God, do a mighty work here and beyond. We ask in the name of Jesus. Would you stand, sing with us this morning as we worship? Will you respond to God's call upon your life?